the first time that I went with my friend Mindy to a movie theater, I was almost jailed for homicide. Because Mindy is what I call a movie talker. Do many of you have friends who are movie talkers? These are the people in your life who seemingly do not realize that they are in a crowded cinema where everybody else is as quiet as rocks because they will continue to talk from the opening credits to the closing credits. When Mindy was the slightest bit confused, she would lean over and ask for clarification at full volume, of course. When she was the slightest bit afraid, she would verbalize her fears with shrieks and instructions to don't go in there or, uh, well, that was a bad idea. <laughs> Over the course of two hours, Mindy talked about everything. And so by the time it ended, I'd worked up a pretty good mad. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to let this slide. And then I thought of all of you, moviegoers across America who were relying on me in that moment to do a little bit of education of my own. So I said to her, I said, Mindy, I know you like to talk doing, during movies. However, I'm wondering in the future if maybe you could limit the amount of comments you make. Or if you feel like you need to make a comment, perhaps you could whisper it. And then with a, with a flip of her hair as if to totally dismiss what I was saying as completely ludicrous, she said to me, well, as a matter of fact, I can't. I'm a human. We humans, we talk. That's just what we do. And that, friends, is when I was almost jailed for homicide. <laughs> almost, but not. I let it go. I went home. But in the years following that, it has occurred to me that she's not completely wrong, is she? We're human beings. We talk. That's just what we do. But have you ever wondered, when you consider that communicating with words is so central to the experience of being a human being, why that is? Why is it that we human beings communicate with words but other creatures don't? Even other plants and insects, other animals, they don't speak with words. Why is that? Sure, bees can buzz to signal their location or, or seals may honk to show their delight. But there is no other creature on earth that communicates with the same level of texture and nuance and color and emotion that we humans do with our words. Why is that? In his great book, A Palpable God, Reynolds Price once said that, that speaking with words, indeed storytelling, is so central to homo sapiens that it is second in necessity after food, but it is before both love and shelter. You think about that. You can, you can travel all over this planet and you will find communities where people live without homes and without hugs. But there has never been a civilization that exists without words. Why is that? You see, communicating with words is just part of being a human being, and that shouldn't come as a surprise to those of us who follow, in particular, the Christian tradition. This notion that words are so important, it's part of our sacred text. It's something that many of us have forgotten in the first chapter of Genesis. You will remember that story, perhaps, where God creates world with words. With speech, God creates seaweed and roses, caterpillars and cats, riptides and supernovas. With a whisper, skin derives from dust and divine breath inflates lungs. Now, so the story goes at this point, God gives all human beings a gift, the imago Dei. It's a fancy Latin word that means image of God, that all of us who have entered this room, Republican, Democrat, White, brown, black, cisgender, transgender, straight, gay, lesbian, we all bear within us the image of Almighty God. And what is this? Well, we've debated this, theologians, for centuries. But I think if you consider this text, one possible answer, one probable answer is that it's the ability to communicate. One Episcopal writer has said that God could have made us stone creatures or sea creatures or tree creatures or winged creatures, but God chose to make us speech creatures instead. Human beings created in God's own image, which is to say imbued with the power to bring worlds into existence ourselves through the power of our words. Now, your words will not cause plants to sprout, but they can cause hope to spring forth in a human heart. The words you choose to use can cause a head to snap sideways. It can shake 
listeners awake. It can convince someone to enter into a lifelong covenant to share life with you. You see, God birthed us with words, and now we find ourselves pregnant, walking this earth in constant labor pains, giving birth ourselves to worlds all around us through the power of our words. Speech is central to the experience of existence, but it is not just a human act. I think it can also be a holy act, a supernatural act act. You see, not long after I had that experience with Mindy, I ran across a a verse in the Bible that I had never seen before. Maybe I'd seen it, but I'd never noticed it. Paul writes in the second letter to the Corinthian church, we believe and therefore we speak. That there is this kind of speech that that happens for people of faith. A kind of sacred speech, a spiritual speech. That that there is belief and articulation that can be knitted together in a sacred way when we open our mouth. And he's not the first person to realize this. After that first chapter in Genesis, words play a prominent role throughout the sacred text, though many of us have forgotten them. You may remember when Moses descended Mount Sinai lugging those two stone tablets. He was bringing ten phrases, ten watchwords for Israel. It's a curious list if you stop to read them. One recognizes the need for rest. One says you shouldn't cheat on your spouse. Another says make sure that you don't covet your neighbor's house or spouse or ass, which seems pretty easy to do depending on the quality of your neighbor's ass. But when it comes to words, God doubles up. We get two commands, not just one. The first command forbids bearing false witness, which is really just an expensive way of saying that hate speech and slander and lying are all bad news. And another one says, do not take God's name in vain. The point of this is, I think, that speaking is too important to do carelessly, especially when we are speaking God. Now, of course, when this event is over, when that Decalogue is chiseled, words continue to play a prominent role in Israel's history. They begin to pass on stories, God stories from generation to generation, gathered around campfires long before the invention of pens or parchment or papyrus. They were Israel. In the words of theologian Walter Brueggemann, primarily a community of utterance, the prophets, were deemed faithful or unfaithful by the words they use or the words that they withhold. From the weeping Jeremiah to the dreaming Isaiah to the passionate Elijah. Who can forget Elijah? And one of the best, uh, one of my favorite stories in all the Bible, Elijah climbs Mount Horeb and Israel's God says, stand before me. And so he stands and a fire comes down upon the face of that mountain. But Yahweh was not in the fire and a wind sweeps across the face of that mountain but God was not in the wind and a quake shakes the foundations of that mountain but God is not in the quake and then God comes and how does God come God comes in a still small voice in words God comes which is the way so often God comes to us all Well, by the time the Christian tradition arises, it borrows this tradition, this love of spirituality and speech and carries it forward. You'll remember Jesus, who the Apostle John calls the Word of God. He stands in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth and says, I have been anointed by God to what? To proclaim, which is to say to speak God. And the three years of his ministry were, first and foremost, a ministry of words. He would say, come follow me. He would say, blessed are the meek. He would say, your faith has healed you. And with every one of those utterances, lame legs would dance and cataracts would dissolve into the atmosphere. Jesus loved language so much that when he gave his final instructions to his disciples, he would say, go therefore into all the world and speak God. Shortly after his death, His disciples are gathered around in a room wondering what to do next. And you remember what happened. A wind swept into that room and they breathed it into their lungs. And when it came out, they made words they did not know they knew. In fact, if you look back over the text, you will find that every time God attempts to do something new, it is inaugurated with a linguistic miracle. Why is this? What would it look like to get 
curious about this. So by the time we encounter Paul in 2 Corinthians, we realize that Paul is drawing from a rich tradition in both the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures we believe and we therefore speak. But that's easier said than done, isn't it, in a world like ours? To speak about that which we believe, to have religious and spiritual conversations with our friends and our family, our neighbors and our coworkers. I realized how difficult this was about six years ago when I relocated from here in Atlanta to New York City. And I started to have conversations and I realized they were a little bit more difficult than they used to be. Some people didn't understand the religious language that I had taken for granted all of my life. Other people use these sacred words, but they use them with wildly different meanings. I began to notice a pattern emerging in my speech. Conversations would flow freely so long as I stuck to benign topics, but the moment the subject turned spiritual, the conversation would stall out. They would ask me for a definition, please, about a, a word that I had used, and I would stutter and sputter and, and stammer, trying to figure out what it was I meant. It was like trying to define the word color or the, words that I'd used all my life, but had never stopped to ask the question that many of us do not stop to ask, which is, what am I saying when I'm saying what I'm saying. So to avoid this tension, I took all of these sacred words, put them in a pile, and swept them out the door. And you know what I'm realizing? That I'm not the only one. Because I'm having conversations with individuals all across this country who come from similar histories of belief, who also feel they have been struck mute in a strange land. They're having trouble having these conversations. They, they, they tell me that they try to use a word like, uh, like sin or hell. Well, those words have become so negative, they lodge in their throats. They attempt to use a word like grace or salvation. Well, they've used those words so often, they don't even know what they mean anymore. Other words like mercy or love. The definitions and connotations of these words can no longer be assumed. And so they, too, have stopped speaking God. Shortly after I moved to New York, I conducted a national survey with the help of the Barna Group of over 1,000 Americans. And you know what I found? I found that most of us, we're not speaking God. In fact, more than two-thirds of Americans say that they do not have spiritual or religious conversations on a regular basis. About one-fourth of Americans say they haven't had a spiritual conversation at all in the last year. And only 7% of Americans say that they have a spiritual or religious conversation about once a week. Now, I expected that among practicing Christians, people like me, that number would skyrocket, but it didn't. Only about 13% of practicing Christians say they have spiritual or religious conversations on a regular basis. That's about one in eight. And why? Why are we so tongue-tied? Well, respondents gave a range of reasons. About a quarter of respondents said that spiritual and religious conversations always create tension or arguments. And of course, if you've ever been at a Thanksgiving dinner and Uncle Philip is shaking that drumstick at you across the table, telling you about what the Bible really means, you can understand why this would scare people away. We have enough tension in our lives without fighting over religion. An additional 20% say that religious language has become too politicized. They hear politicians and presidents trying to talk like pastors, and it all feels very manipulative, and so people stay away. Other people say that they don't, they don't like the way that religion is presented in popular culture, that it makes them feel embarrassed. They're tired of the promises of toothy televangelists and the screeds of street preachers. And others still say that they have been hurt by religious language in the past, that they had pastors or parents or friends who have turned religious words into weapons to oppress or repress, to shame or to scold them. For whatever reason, it has become toxic. In the United States now, for most of us, we believe, but we do not therefore speak. We have lost our therefore. And this, as it turns out, matters. Because there's an emerging body of research now that shows that the language we use, the words we use or choose not to use, actually shapes us in ways we're only beginning to realize. 
It shapes our thinking, our perceptions, our worldviews, our associations, our attitudes, more than we ever realized. That the words that we use shape the thoughts we think, and the thoughts we think shape the actions, shape the actions we take, and those actions collectively are shaping our society. According to Google Ingram data, there has been a 50% or greater drop in 70% of our religious or moral words. Words like grace, mercy, kindness, compassion have all dropped by 50% or more in the last 100 years. And so what happens is, is we wake up one day and we look at this country that we live in and we say, this is not a gracious place and it's not a compassionate place and it's not a kind place. And what we fail to recognize is that we have been birthing the country that we now live in through the words we've been using all along. So what do we do? I think there's hope. Because I started to study linguistics. And over that year, I kept running across this term that I'd never seen before. Linguists talk about what they call comeback languages. These are languages that, 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 that went to the end, to the brink of extinction, but then somehow they were revived. They came back. Perhaps the best example of this in modern times is Hebrew, but there are obviously a lot of other examples like Irish, Hawaiian, Welsh. All of these have sort of been re-emerging. They've been reviving themselves. That languages can actually come back, but it depends on people, well, like people like you, who are willing to do the difficult work of having these messy conversations because you believe that in the end it would be worth it. And how do you do that? What does it mean to learn to speak God from scratch? I heard a talk a few years ago called The Virtuous Preacher by a lady named Barbara Brown Taylor. And in it, she said, it is the integrity of a speaker that matters most. Words matter, she said. But, but the effectiveness of a speaker is more dependent on who a speaker is than what a speaker says. We can sit around and talk about techniques for having spiritual conversations. But the real question is whether we are not just a God seeker, but whether we are attempting to mold ourselves, shape ourselves, nurture who we are into becoming a God speaker. There are some virtues I think we'll need. One of these is courage. It takes courage to talk about anything these days. I mean, you go on Facebook, you talk about kittens and rainbows, and there's haters. Kittens? <laughs> Like, what is the deal with kittens? I was, it, it, it's, it's even harder, I think, to have conversations about things like politics or religion. What are you doing in your life to become a courageous person? You're going to need courage if you want to speak God. Vulnerability is another one. You see, speaking God is not preaching at people. Pre speaking God is quite literally bearing your soul to another. To open yourself up, your shadows and your struggles, your disappointments and your doubts and your hopes and letting other people see that and interact with that. That's what it means to speak God. What are you doing in your life to nurture vulnerability? You'll need it if you want to speak God. Speaking God also takes passion. You see, when Paul says we believe but we do not therefore speak. We read this as sort of post-enlightenment individuals. We think about belief as a cognitive thing, which is not at all what Paul is talking about. You see, you, you, you believe something in your heart. You know something in your head. The, the best synonym for Paul's word to believe is the modern word to be love. If you love something, Paul says, it will just sort of bubble up inside of you and it will spill out of your mouth. And the truth of the matter is, is most of us don't speak God because most of us long ago lost our passion for God. What are you doing in your life to stoke the flame of passion for God? You'll need that if you want to speak God from scratch. I have hope that the language of faith can be revived in our time. And if you're still not convinced, come back with me to New York City. Meet one of my friends, one of my Hasidic Jewish friends, and listen to the strange language that they speak. Yiddish. Yiddish almost disappeared at the end of last century, in part due to the Holocaust. But it's been reviving. It's been coming back, in part because Yiddish speakers decided that they wanted to bring it back. It was brought back by people 
like a gentleman named Isaac Beshivis Singer. He won the Nobel Prize in 1978 in literature, even though he only wrote in Yiddish, a dying language. A journalist once asked Singer, why would you write in Yiddish, a dying language? And he said something, and it's always stuck with me. He said, I like ghost stories, and I also believe in resurrection. And every time I hear that story, I think the same thing. I think, you're not the only one. I believe in resurrection too. I believe in a God who is willing and powerful enough to bring God's own son back from the dead. So why can I not believe that God, with our help, partnering with us, could bring back the language of faith in this, the 21st century? And so that is my prayer for every one of you, that you would become passionate, courageous, vulnerable God speakers yourself. But please don't do it while the movie is playing. <laughs> Thank you.